Teaching gospel okay. doctrine, yes. So, and also working with public affairs for the last couple of decades. So I have. For the last 21 years, I've had a church calling in public affairs for the San Francisco Bay Area. So she met her husband in law school, and they've been married for 34 years, and are the parents of six children, and have three daughters in law, so we have five grandchildren. So and one on the way. So, so, <laughs> so well, thank you so much for that very kind yes. introduction. So today I'm going to give you a little bit of my story of how I ended up here today. And so I always sort of start out with how did a Mormon mother of six end up in a place like this or as a public official to rather liberal California. And I will point out that this cute little, and I don't know if I have a pointer on this, this cute little girl is sitting right there <laughs> in the maroon. Is Oh, it's the top one. Okay. Meet Elizabeth and Beth, who is a junior here in the Marriott School of Business. So I grew up in Hawaii, and I love these pictures because we really did not grow up in a little grass hut, but my mother had a sense of humor in the early Christmas cards. And so actually, I grew up with my four sisters in a very normal-looking home, and we had a really fun childhood. In the 1970s, though, it was a really interesting time. And I graduated from high school in 1978. This is me with my, with again, my four sisters. My mother here had, um, was working on her master's degree at the University of Hawaii. And she would go down to the Hawaii legislature, actually as part of a public affairs church assignment to help monitor legislation. And as a 16-year-old girl, one day I was sitting in a legislative hearing and there were these brilliant women with all of these arguments why certain laws should be passed and some of the church women my mother had brought along would stand up and say, I know in my heart that you shouldn't do this. And I just thought as a 16 year old, why aren't there more women representing my values? And it had a very profound influence on me at that time. However, when I went off to BYU, I planned to major in music. My mother, because she had four daughters, had a string quartet. And so we were all musicians and I went to BYU as I said, as a music major, but took a public policy political science class my freshman year and just really realized this is what I wanted to do, instead major in political science. So graduated in 1978, excuse me, 1982 from BYU, degree in public policy. I was engaged to be married. I was supposed to be married in June of 1982. I didn't get married. And I always put a note to those of you who are not married, if you get engaged and it doesn't feel right, call off the wedding. Don't hesitate to do so. And I ended up calling off my wedding about six weeks before I was supposed to get married. And my father, who is an attorney, said to me, you know, why don't you take the LSAT? You've thought about law school in the past, and you always thought you'd do it after you had children. So in June, I took the LSAT. And BYU was very kind because back in the 1980s, we did not have as many women applying to law school. And so I was admitted, started law school instead. 
married my husband while I was in law school. He was a year ahead of me in law school. That's not a reason to go to law school. You don't go there to meet your husband. I was fortunate enough to do so. But when I graduated, I was four months pregnant with our first child. And that was something that I really had to confront as a woman, as a woman of faith. How was I going to balance my career, my children, all of that moving forward. And fortunately, there's this wonderful talk, and if any of you have an opportunity to go back and pull it up, it's from 12th of February, 1985, devotional address, later printed in the Enzyme, and Elder Faust gave his talk and message to my granddaughters. And this one excerpt I'm gonna read right now is something where he is quoting Sarah Davidson, who was a professor at Harvard, where, she's, where he says, but my dear granddaughters, you cannot do everything well at the same time. You cannot be 100% wife, 100% mother, 100% church worker, 100% career person, and 100% public service person at the same time. How can all of these roles be coordinated, says Sarah Davidson, this woman he's quoting. The only answer I come up with is that you can have it sequentially. At one stage, you may emphasize career, and at another marriage and nurturing young children, at any point, you'll be aware of what is missing. If you are lucky, you will be able to fit everything in. And then he goes on to quote from Ecclesiastes that there's a time and a season for everything. And this was so profound to me as a young attorney, as a young mother of recognizing that there were seasons in my life. So I graduated um, past the Hawaii bar holding a 10-week-old baby, uh, or sworn in as an attorney with our 10-week-old baby, and began working in our prosecuting attorney's office in Hawaii where I had clerked for the last two summers writing appellate briefs. I could stay home full-time with my son, and then I could leave him with a babysitter occasionally when the Hawaii Supreme Court or the Intermediate Court of Appeals would call up my cases for oral argument, then I would leave him for that. And then we moved to, to the mainland. We moved to California, and we were living in Morgan Hill. By that point, you can see I have four cute little children. Elizabeth had not yet been born. And I had been working part-time, not because I'd wanted necessarily to practice law, but because my Stake Relief Society president, when we moved to the mainland and she found out I had just passed the California bar exam, said to me, I want you to meet this lawyer. And I said to her, I don't want to work. I want to stay home with my, at the, that time, two little boys. And she said, no, you need to meet this lawyer down in Morgan Hill. We hit it off, as I always say, we both used word perfect, and that was a big deal. For those of you who are older, you know that there was a big battle between Microsoft and word perfect, ultimately Microsoft word won, but nevertheless, I began working for this attorney about 15 hours a week, and by the time our fourth son, this cute little baby here, Michael, was born, I just thought, they need a mom more than a lawyer, I'm gonna put my career on hold, and so I resigned from the practice, but I turned on the TV one night, and this was because I had a colicky baby, and back then there were about eight TV channels because this was 1991, and I came to the city's TV channel, and it was their government channel. And back then, it wasn't computer-generated content like we have today, but it was a scrolling announcement, and they announced that they had two city commission Available, available for they were looking for someone to sit on the Parks Commission and the Rent Stabilization, Rent Stabilization Commission. And I thought, well, I could do that. You know, I've got this degree in public policy. I'm an attorney. They just meet once a month in the evening when my husband's home. And so I packed up the double stroller, took all four kids down to City Hall, and I filled out the application saying I'd serve on either commission. And I heard nothing. And no one called me up for an interview. No one even acknowledged receiving my application. I just thought, I, my hands are full. I've got these four little kids who were 0, 2, 4, and 6 years old. But I thought probably there's someone more prepared, someone they need in that position. And a few weeks later, I turned on the TV. Once again, nothing on TV. Came across the government channel. That night, the city council was in session, and I just said, oh, I wonder what they're up to tonight. And immediately, as I turned it there, I heard someone say, I move that we appoint Candace Anderson to the Parks Commission. And I just thought, okay, this is so weird. I'm sitting here at home watching this on TV. This is pre-cell phones, so there, were, there, were, there wasn't a way to text someone or anything else. 
And then someone else said, well, we just put her on the Rent Stabilization Commission. Do you think she'd serve on both? And it was just such a bizarre set of circumstances. But then the clerk said, well, I met her, and she seems like the kind of gal that wants to roll up her sleeves and get involved. I say, let's put her on both. And so, you know, from the privacy of my home, I watched myself appointed to two city commissions. And they did, they met once a month. One of the commissions got disbanded because of funding issues. The California, state of California was in a crisis in the early 90s. And nevertheless, it was a valuable experience and I got to know the city council. And in 1993, one of the city council members moved back east. They had a vacancy. They decided to appoint someone to fill the vacancy. And I will tell you, it's much easier to get appointed to elected office than to get elected. You just have to convince four people. And so I filled up my application. I set up meetings with each of the council members. I contacted friends in the community who I knew, already knew the council members and I ended up being the least objectionable candidate and got appointed to the city council in 1993-94 to fill out the 23 months. And right when it was time for me to run for re-election, my husband got a job offer that would take us up to an area of the Bay Area called Walnut Creek, Danville, where he had grown up. And it was one of those moments where I just thought, it's time to go home. And what was interesting, and I'll get to this in a moment when I talk about issues, there were issues that came up while I sat on Morgan Hill City Council for those 23 months that were really important to the community. And I knew that there was a reason that I was there, but I also, with my desire to balance my career with my family, felt very comfortable saying, I'll serve where I'm needed, but my whole life is not dependent on my political career. So that's where I sort of get into this help where you're needed. Um, first, thing I did when we moved to Danville. These two little boys wanted to go to Cub Scout day camp and when I got there they said the camp is full, we can't handle your two little boys. We moved in the end of May, camp was three weeks later in June. Sweet Elizabeth was at that time actually only about four months old when we moved there. And so they said, well, if you really want to bring your boys to camp, if you will run the whole daycare program for us, the person just dropped out and oversee 55 little children between the ages of three and seven, you can send your boys. And so that's what I did. And again, you help where you're needed. I helped in Girl Scouts camp, kitchen, and did some really fun things in my children's school where it was just a very easy way to give back to the community. And then in 2003, I was in a crossroads again with my youngest who had born. We had had the, the sixth child, Sam, was born. And my oldest, PJ, here, who's graduated of the Marriott School of Business, who, who works in marketing for Pinterest right now, um, he was starting BYU. And I thought, well, should I go back to practicing law? I had kept my license active all these years. What could I possibly do? And my husband had been called the year before as a bishop. And Danville's city council suddenly had a vacancy and sort of history repeats itself and one of the council members had actually been appointed to the board of supervisors in the position I currently serve and they were going to appoint someone and my husband walked into our room one summer morning where they had a big headline in the local newspaper that said town council to appoint city council member and he threw it down on the bed and he said good morning council member and I just said, I'm not doing this. I've, a bit, I've already done that, you're a bishop. I need to be the supportive wife. You know, we've got still five children at home. And he said, no, you really need to do this. I'm not just the bishop of the people on the ward list, but everyone who lives in the ward boundaries, you need to get out and do that. And after much consideration, I got appointed to a city council again. So I started my role back in local government. Sweet Elizabeth was in the second grade at the time and suddenly got sucked into her mother's public life and going to a lot of community events. And I was very comfortable giving back to the community. There were some wonderful opportunities, and I'll go into a little bit more of some of the things you get to do when you serve on a city council as well. Um, 2012, this was a very interesting race. I hadn't planned on running for county supervisor. My predecessor developed cancer, chose not to run. And 
my first thought was my opponent, this woman, Tommy Vandebroek, my primary opponent, she had been campaigning for six months. I thought, this will be a shoe in for her. She'll win the Board of Supervisors race. I was just starting my second term as mayor of Danville. And friends started texting me and emailing me saying, you need to look at this race. And I just thought, I don't want to do this. This is too hard. I'm very comfortable in my circumstances. And my oldest son, who at the time was working for Google, he and I sort of penciled out, what would a campaign cost? I could run a city council race with twelve dollars to $15,000. A county race would cost me a minimum of $100,000 that I would have to raise. I don't like asking for money. I don't like raising money. It's really challenging. But nevertheless, felt like the right thing to do. And so I began my campaign. However, in California, I'm viewed a little bit more conservative. And when I was mayor of Danville, I had supported Proposition 8. And so the moment I announced my candidacy, I immediately had people saying, she's homophobic, she's um, a Mormon, she has funny eyes. I mean, just you know, these amazing attacks on me. And polling was done by my, by my primary opponent. As you can see, there were three people in this race. Sean White was a photovoltaic professor, former chiropractor who didn't want to campaign other than digitally. Um, Tommy, my opponent, did, her, did polling, or someone did it for her, that showed I could win this race in June. And if you won in June with more than 50%, you didn't have to go to November runoff by 18 percentage points because I was the mayor of Danville, I was a former prosecutor, two thirds of the district was in, the, in my end of the county, my end of the district. But if she could challenge me on my conservative Mormon beliefs, she could narrow it to 3%. So the whole campaign became always pro-choice, always equality of marriage, and just attacking my beliefs. And it was interesting because I, had through all of our challenges in California with Prop 8. Um, I have many wonderful gay, lesbian friends, family members, individuals, and I had always been very supportive of same-sex partner benefits. Um, certainly the issue of abortion had been decided back in, in many, many years ago in Roe v. Wade. And so I had to, in all of my debates, come to, and say, we all come to the table with different values, different beliefs, different religions, different cultures. What we need to do is focus on those issues that we do agree upon and focus on those ones that are truly county issues. And so it was a challenging campaign, but I felt very confident in being able to recognize and respect the values and beliefs of others. And so as you can see, I was fortunate enough to, to win with just under 60% of it, despite the challenge, it's sort of you know trying to portray me, as I say, Sarah Palin on steroids. And it was just sort of a very funny um, race because I tend to be a very moderate um, Republican, although this is a nonpartisan race and although I could talk for a very long time about the problems with all partisan politics. That's why I like to serve in nonpartisan offices. We have just a very crazy time going on in our country right now, and I think it's very important that we recognize the value that each voice brings. And I think Katrina gave us just such great advice about why we need leaders in politics who are not there because it's for their ego, or they're not there because they're trying to get a name for themselves, but they're trying to make a difference in their community. So here's my, here's, I mean, we're gonna jump in. That was my story. Now we're gonna talk about why I love serving in local government. And you know, the first one I always talk about is you get to create the laws. You're not just responding to them. You're not the one, you're just not there complaining, given three minutes during public comment time to say, I don't like this. But you are the one who gets to make the laws. You get to, particularly on the county level in California, we oversee all of the health and human services. So we oversee the welfare programs, the poverty programs, the jails, the district attorney, the public defender. We get to oversee a very large county health department. My county budget is about $3.5 billion. And much of that are federal and state programs that we oversee. We get to make some great decisions about quality of life, health and safety, and ultimately, 
solve problems, provide help to those in need. And so these are, I'm not gonna go through all, these are the different boards and committees that I get to serve on where there's just this wide variety of issues that really are affecting my, my community. You get to, when you serve in local, gov local government, you develop positive working relationships with other elected officials. And so my state senator, my state assemblywoman, my congressman, I have two that overlap in my district. I can call them up anytime I've got a concern, anytime there's an issue that's taking place in our community, and have a really good, robust discussion about what we're doing. For those of you who used to live in Lafayette, <laughs> that's the fourth bore of the Caldecott Tunnel that has gone through. And so that was a, a major achievement in traffic congestion in the San Francisco Bay Area. And so it was a really fun day when we got to open that. Um, you get to dispel notions of people of faith and really, like I said, identify issues that we have in common. Now, this is what happens when you Google Mormon woman. I mean, this is what people perceive us as, as Mormon women, as women of faith, that we are oftentimes sort of these backwards women that are being controlled by a male patriarchy, that we, I cannot tell you how many people still think that members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints still practice polygamy and that my husband has multiple wives. So I think for me, it's been really valuable over these last 30 years, just being able to be out in the community and having people become comfortable saying to me, you know, what is this thing? Why don't you drink coffee? Or why don't you, um, you know, have, why do you have such strict rules at BYU? Or why is, what's this thing about Sundays where you don't want to do things, where you're not out playing like the rest of us? So it's really a great opportunity to spell those notions. And you get to do fun issues. So I'm going to highlight a few issues. Um, homeless. Right now in Contra Costa County, when we do a point in time count, we have anywhere probably between 3,500 to 4,500 homeless people living in our community. You know, last year housing, 947 of them was a really big deal. It's a challenge. In our county, we spend $43 million a year on health services for the homeless. Of that 43 million, 13% use up 83% of it. And so you have a very small segment using up that, that funding. When you pull in the amount we spend on homeless individuals, if you throw in the first responders time, which would be your police officers, your medical fire personnel, EMTs, we spend over 100 million on our homeless population. And wouldn't it be nice to come up with solutions to house them? And, and we're working on those. Um, Immigrant and refugee families. This is such a challenging, challenging issue in California right now. Now, as a county supervisor, I have zero control over immigration. I have no control over whether someone is allowed into the country or not, but I have within my county hundreds, thousands of immigrants who are here without documentation. And so we have had to, as a county, come up with ways of how are we going to help those who are uninsured. And so Contra Costa Cares here is a program where we provide some primary care services to those who are not here legally. In California, children who are here illegally can receive Medi-Cal, um, which is our Medicare <coughs> services. With Contra Costa Cares, we're able to provide medical services to several thousand people who would otherwise not have it. Stand Together Contra Costa is one where I, a program that I had to grapple with a little bit. It's one where we provide legal services and assistance along with many nonprofits. We just help fund a very small segment to those immigrants who are being detained, who may who generally will not have had any criminal proceedings, but because they would benefit by some legal help as to why they might, why they might be able to stay here, we have a program that assists them. Our Employment and Human Services also assists with all of that. Right now, and I was talking to a few people about it earlier, we in our county jail, we've had a contract since 1992 with the U.S. Marshal's Office to De provide detention services. These are ice holds where when Immigrations and Customs detain someone, 
they come to our county jail to a specialized wing. They have keys to their cells. It's a very low security jail. They have access to all of our services. More importantly, they have access to their families who can come and visit them and other nonprofits. However, in my county, people are concerned that we are assisting ICE by having the detainees in our county jail, even though it's a contract that's been there since 1992. They would like to see us end that contract immediately, in which case ICE would not go away, but these detainees would end up either somewhere in Central California, Arizona, or Texas. And so you get to grapple when you're a local official with issues like this. Um, in my role as a county supervisor, I get to help oversee early childhood education. And these are some federal programs as well as state programs where the very poorest of the poor in our community have access to preschools where the mothers can work or if mothers are staying home, they can also provide some enhanced education for their children. Mental illness is something that is very near and dear to my heart simply because it is something that is tied to so many of our other issues. Currently, in the United States, we have more people who are mentally ill in our jails than we do in mental hospitals. And it's just one of those realities, and I've been very involved in a program called Stepping Up, which is to try to help keep the mentally ill out of our jails. We in Contra Costa County, several years ago, implemented something called WARA's Law, and it's an assisted outpatient treatment. And Within two years of me being on the Board of Supervisors, we got this ball rolling, but it really started from one voice, from a woman coming to me, a woman named Melinda Doherty, and she came to my office just a few weeks after I became a county supervisor in 2012, and she said, we need to implement Laura's Law. And I smiled and said, well, tell me about Laura's Law. I know nothing about it, and she said, let me tell you a story, and she told me how her 83-year-old father, her 37-year-old son, had been bludgeoned to death in Fresno County and by a mentally ill neighbor. The whole community knew he was mentally ill. He had actually committed a crime the year before, but was released because he was not deemed competent to stand trial. But there was no way to require him to accept services because he didn't want to. He didn't believe he had a problem. And so we've implemented something where if someone's over the age of 18, they have a severe mental illness, they've either been incarcerated or they've been hospitalized within the last two years, and they refuse to follow a treatment plan, we can start extending some very intense assisted outpatient treatment services. And if they still don't want to comply, we can bring them before a judge and have a judge order them to do so. But those are some of the other issues you get to deal with when you're in a local level. You get to ensure public safety. I'm standing between one of my favorite former police chiefs, one of my favorite current fire chiefs, and as a local official, you really get to decide exciting things like fire stations and how many, what type of ambulance services. One of the first issues I confronted as a county supervisor, and I don't know if it's a problem in Utah or other states, but when someone would call 911 for medical emergency, they would get not just an ambulance, but you'd get a fire engine and an ambulance. And the reason for that in most areas is you are much better staffed for fire personnel. Most of them are cross-trained to be either paramedics or EMTs. So they would show up and then later an ambulance might show up. And so in my role, I've been able to make government much more efficient. We've implemented something where we have it's called the Alliance, it sounds very mysterious, but it's really just an alliance with one of our ambulance provi providers, AMR, and our fire district to ensure that we dispatch the right equipment, the right personnel to an emergency, and you don't have such duplication of services when not needed. I get to oversee libraries. Who, do, who doesn't like a library? And it, libraries in California are part of a county system. These are my, some of my favorite libraries. For those of you who are familiar, the Danville Library, the Rinda Library, the Lafayette Library. And in California, our counties oversee the libraries, but you find the government can't do things alone, and so you have tremendous services that, from, of the community who help fundraise and make our libraries so much better. I get to design public buildings. These are two buildings. This is an old veterans building in downtown Danville. It's a historic building built right after World War I. It was in very much disrepair. We were ready to tear it down and realized 
Now we could preserve this and put a new wing on the back and use it for veteran services design. This is a public park in Danville that I got to work. You get to make good decisions about planning, land use, preserving open space. You get to do things to make balanced decisions. And it's funny, this one, somehow going from my Apple platform to Windows platform, did not like this. This was going to show you the soccer complex in Morgan Hill. Two weeks after I was elected to the Morgan Hill, or appointed Morgan Hill City Council in 1993, one evening a developer came in, we had the Chamber of Commerce, we had local members of the Catholic Church, they came in and said, we want to turn the Golden Oak Restaurant, sort of the big family restaurant in Morgan Hill, into a 26 table card room, a gambling casino. And I remember sitting there on the dais thinking, oh, that's why I'm here. There's got to be a reason for why this mom of four little kids, who at the time were ages two, four, six, and eight, is sitting there. And so I was able to, through a variety of support from the community, build a very large soccer complex across the street from the restaurant. So that's what's in that very obscured. Um, more recently, the Lafayette Christian Church is a wonderful church in Lafayette that had a wonderful residence donated to them for their pastor to live in. It was going to be, the, the, they were getting the parsonage exemption. Well, the pastor moved out in October. They were trying to find a new one. And they kept the house vacant, hoping to move someone else in there. In the meantime, they stored church vestments and they held choir practice in there. But my tax assessor for the county said, you don't have a pastor in there. You have to pay the $10,000 property tax. You're no longer exempt. And he refused to back away. And so through the Board of Supervisors, I was very happily able to help them realize, no, this is still exempt property. This is a church. And when some of my fellow supervisors started inquiring about, well, I don't know if their use of it for this really constitutes a religious purpose, I was able to say, don't even go there. <laughs> That's not our role as government to question what a church is doing with their property. If they're using it for, for church purposes, we have the right to give them that exemption. And this interesting church down here is actually a Sufi reoriented temple built in unincorporated Walnut Creek, which drew great outrage from neighbors. And it was a very helpful community process to try to help people understand the importance of even if we didn't understand someone else's faith and religion, that we still need to respect their right to do what they wanted to within there as long as they could meet our zoning guidelines and facilitate that. So if you want to get involved, I always say start get to know the local issues, go online. I, in my community, we have a few monthly papers, a few weekly papers, and online news sources. And you start looking at what are the issues in my community. And then you familiarize yourself with city and county websites, sign up for alerts about issues, and again, luckily, neither Lafayette nor the county's websites really look like that. Again, it's a cross-platform error, and I don't know what's going on. But go on to websites. Start looking at what are they having hearings about. I love this quote from President Hinckley. Teach those for whom you are responsible the importance of good civic manners. Encourage them to become involved, remembering in public deliberations that the quiet voice of substance and reasoning is more persuasive than the noisy, screaming voice of protest. In accepting such responsibilities, our people will bless their communities, their families, and the church. Go to hearings, get involved. One voice makes such a difference. Um, identify, meet with your opinion leaders in your community. And again, not sure what's going on with my slide, but nevertheless, I'm sitting there with the mayor of San Ramon and Terry Caney, who's with our Office of Education. People are elected to represent you. Call up a city council member and just say, or your mayor, and say, I just want to meet you and find out how I might be of assistance in our communities. Get to know your business leaders, the presidents of service clubs, Kiwanis, Rotaries, Lions Clubs. Meet the editors of local newspapers, and they're oftentimes public affairs representatives of agencies from your gas, electric, sewer, all of those. And then start looking at various government boards and commissions that seem 
interesting to you. Start reviewing their agendas. Again, a lovely picture where you can see the top of some of our heads. <laughs> um, these are some types of commissions that we have in cities and in counties. And you can go to your website, look at those and think, do any of those interest me? Is this something I'd be curious about? Attend a meeting and see the dynamics of the group. Sometimes they aren't the best fit. Um, and then identify these specific opportunities to be appointed to a board or commission. You can go to a city or county website and they will usually say openings on this commission, watch for announcements online through press releases, like I said, meet with the mayor or council member or call up a city clerk and find out where are these openings. If you're not involved in the community, join a community group. Again, I just grabbed these off my local community of all of these different groups, whether it be something involving the arts, a chamber of commerce, older gentlemen often do sons in retirement, chamber of commerce is there, a veterans memorial building, taxpayers, all kinds of interesting issues. Uh, leadership classes. I don't know if any of you are familiar with a leadership class, but they're very common in communities where it'll be a year-long process. They will bring in, you'd meet once a month, usually for one day, once a month, and they would bring in different speakers to give you a full understanding of how your community operates. And in the Bay Area, we have some great ones, and as I did some checking into it in Utah, Nevada, many of them are there as well. I usually come in and speak to many of these groups for about an hour, just sort of helping them understand what a county does in California. Now here is another, and I'm so sorry again, I don't know why these slides have all come, become distorted. This is a picture of my family, and they're really much more attractive than this. And the whole point of this is talk to your family. The most important thing you do is figure out how does it work. I, there's such a balance in life that needs to be had, and you certainly don't want to ruin your family's lives by getting involved in the community, but figure out how much time you have to spare. And that used to be a very helpful discussion with my husband about my various responsibilities, what would this do or to help or not help our family? Seek out good candidates to support in local, state, or national elections. If you don't feel like getting involved, these are some of my friends. This is my assemblywoman. These two have served on a city council. This is one of my favorite state senators who represents my district. Some are Republicans, some are Democrats. Um, doesn't matter. Find good citizens, good people out there who support what you want to see take place in good government. Um, run for office yourself, and I'm so sorry you can't see this because this was a cute picture of my family um, when we were running for office way back when. And then campaign trainings. I'm always encouraging women who are interested in running for office. There are so many campaign trainings out there that can help prepare you, help you figure out how to fundraise, help you figure out if it's a partisan race, if you can get support from Dems or Republicans. They are all really helpful. Oftentimes, even if you don't support all of their values, they will still let you um, attend them. And so I really encourage people to do that as well. And then you've got to identify your grassroots support. If you're going to run for office, you need a core group, particularly if it's a small city council. You know, if you've got maybe 50,000 people in your community, 100,000, they will be the ones who will help you develop a platform. I always suggest that people have what I call a kitchen cabinet. They're close friends that sit around their kitchen table and say to you, that's a really dumb idea. Or no, I think people like that. Bounce your ideas off them. You want these people for endorsements. Some of them may be great for web design, for social media. You need people out there talking about you in the community online. You need people walking neighborhoods, putting lawn signs in their yards. Dear friend cards, which people still like postcards. And so part of any campaign, I've always had friends who write dear friends to their friends, little postcards saying, I know her, she's good. Letters to the editor, both online and hard copy. And then you've got to raise money. And that's probably the hardest thing. But think you think back of who are all these people I know that I work with up here. I just have a variety of individuals that are who you might be coming in contact with. Obviously, you got to have a marketing plan, establish yourself on the internet, 
do any of you regularly Google yourself? Who Googles themselves? Okay, some of you do. <laughs> I don't know if people want to admit it, but you've got to start with um, Googling yourself. Figure out what's out there. If someone wants to know a little bit about you, what will they find? Set up Google Alerts, very easy. And if you have a name like I do with Anderson, you would want to Google, set up a Google Alert for both Anderson with an S-E-N and with Anderson with an S-O-N, which is the more common spelling because most people not most people, oftentimes it's misspelled. You, you know, secure your domain name, setting up a website, you start posting on the web so that you start raising yourself up in the Google searches and other, whatever, what other search engine someone might be using. And then print marketing, there's still some that you have to do. You look, you know, I'm one of those people who loves to see what shows up in my mailbox during election time because it's just fascinating particularly when you've got a race where you've got people competing with each other, but ask winning officials who they use. It's helpful to have a consultant in a big race. Here's, here's the contrast. Here's, here's one that we didn't use a professional. Just my son and I thought, you know what, this is kind of a nice way. This was the entire Danville Town Council when I was running for county supervisor, and it went to every household in Danville. It wanted, we wanted sort of that homey postcard. This is one that we needed to use when we were doing a mass mailing to more people. And so for that, I did hire someone professional. Check, you know, to find out the best consultants, you can look at campaign finance reports. You can see who they are paying. And then just decide how much you would need a campaign consultant. It's very important to interview them, figure out, do you have something in common? Is this person going to represent you? I'm not one who likes nasty political ads. And any consultant I've used, we've had to make very clear that that would not be ever allowed. An opponent, I would not attack an opponent in any way. In California and in much, many other parts of the country, you can't control independent expenditures. And those are always very embarrassing. When a really horrible ad that supports you comes out, but you had no control over it. Um, you, creating a strong platform, you've got to have a great ballot statement and the right ballot designation. Some people do not like lawyers, and so I don't ever put attorney in my, um, on, the boat, on the ballot. I do put it inside if someone wants to read about it, but you've got to use a consultant, use your kitchen cabinet to decide how are you going to designate yourself. Fully understand, strictly follow campaign finance guidelines. This is my, my dear friend, Mark Peterson, who got disbarred last week, and he lost his post as district attorney because he did something really, really stupid. He started using his campaign funds for personal use, and you can't do that. You need to file forms. One of my fellow supervisors didn't bother fi filing his forms for the last four years. He nevertheless was reelected unopposed, but nevertheless, um, your integrity depends upon you doing the right thing. Be accessible to the media. That's one of the main things. In fact, just yesterday, I was sitting at my desk and I got an email from a reporter saying, hi, I'm the new reporter for the Dan Danville San Ramon Express. Um, please add me to your distribution list for press releases. First thing I did, rather than just forwarding his information to my chief of staff, who handles my press releases, I emailed him right back and I said, welcome. If you ever need to reach me outside of office hours, here is my cell phone. Give me a call. I'm always happy to answer any questions you might have. You want to be the one telling your story. You don't want a reporter telling a story he does not know about. And if you don't ever know an answer, just say, you know what, can I call you right back in a few minutes? I'm not sure if I have all the facts. And then make sure you do find out if they're on a, on a deadline. But when you establish a friendship or relationship with a reporter, you end up with much, much better reporting about you. And it goes to your integrity, your accessibility. And finally, vote. I cannot tell you how many people are not registered to vote. And I, I get a list of all registered voters, and I'm always so surprised, especially in the church, um, people are just not even registered to vote. And it may be they've moved and they sort of forgot, but I love, this is my favorite slogan from Hawaii that I saw 
when I was out in Waimanalo one day at the beach and it said, hey, register to vote, no vote, no grumble, which essentially is saying if you're not going to register to vote, you have no right to complain because you get the elected officials that everyone else chose. So that is my presentation. We are out of time. I would be happy if any of you are ever interested in getting involved in local government, come get my card. I would be delighted to talk to you further. And thank you all. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you, Candace. I think you've just been a wonderful example to all of us of women, women in politics and making a difference. And Thank if any of you have been inspired by what she said, please act on those inspirations because we need more. So I want to give you this. Oh, gift. thank you so much. It's the one that Angel described. Yeah, that Angel so, described, yes. the, the prairie glass yes. puzzle piece. So, and I'll have to see if, if we match. <laughs> okay, thank you thank so you much. Again. My pleasure. Oh, thank Cheers. you so much. Yeah.